In this week's episode of Exhibitionists, we are exploring the magical things that get created when artists are inspired by artists. We'll meet a photographer whose breathtaking images are driven by her love for ballet. We'll meet the opera company keeping the memory of a murdered composer alive. The star of Alias Grace tells us about the visionary director who changed her life. We'll learn how one image made of stones inspired an artistic collaboration between a Canadian and a Syrian. And Kine is here to teach you how to turn your face into a Picasso masterpiece. Hello and welcome to CBC Arts Exhibitionists, the only television show dedicated to putting Canadian artists front and center. I'm your host, Amanda Paris. From the slippers and tutus to the pirouette and arabesque, who hasn't wanted in one time in their life to be a ballet dancer? For Carolina Kouras, it was a childhood dream that she translated into an equally fascinating career. Today, she's taking us inside her studio so that we can get a close up into her process. I'm Carolina Curtis, and I'm a ballet photographer. My interest in photography started very young. My parents were both artists, and they're always taking pictures, so there were always cameras around, and they would develop their own stuff in the dark room, so we always have really beautiful black and white prints. As far back as I can remember, I've loved ballet. My grandma had a TV, there was one channel, and I watched a piece that Baryshnikov danced, and it was so beautiful and so dark, and it just, it had me hooked. There was more than just tutus on stage. It was really stunning, and there was something emotional about it that really grabbed me, and I've just been so attached to it ever since, kind of chasing that feeling, I guess. What I love about ballet is so technical and watching that mastered is so powerful. It's more of a feeling, it's what I grew up with. I love the theater aspect and the acting that's involved. Like, start, open your shoulders. It definitely helps to have a background in ballet um, because I understand what the positions are supposed to look like and it builds trust with the dancers. My first job was as a darkroom tech, so I've always been in love with the darkroom and film cameras, and I collect vintage cameras, and I shoot with all of them that I can still get film for, and I just love the quality. I shoot a lot with a Linhoff Technica 4x5 camera. Um, it's my favorite piece of equipment that I own, and I just love shooting Polaroid on that because I love that the photo exists inside of the camera and there's no screen and it's just a very slow paced um, way of working and I feel like I'll shoot maybe 40, 50 shots in a shoot on the Linhoff and I will love pretty much everything that I do whereas sometimes I'll shoot 2,000 in a shoot on digital and I won't get something that is as good. The most exciting part for me is creating something that I haven't seen before. Perfect. Our exhibitionist in residence this week is a superstar in the world of illustration. You'll be seeing her pieces throughout the show. I'll let Jo Lee take it away. Hi, I'm Jo Lee and I'm an illustrator based in Toronto, Canada, and I'm this week's exhibitionist in residence. The animated guests you're about to see are inspired by the fun and the fantastical. I primarily work in watercolor and I do everything from print media to gifts. And I also have my own stationery line, home goods, and apparel line. Pop 
Pablo Picasso would be 136 this year, and he's still inspiring countless painters, sculptors, ceramists, and even makeup artists. I've asked our favorite makeup guru, Kind, to teach us step-by-step step how to paint Picasso's iconic piece, Head of a Woman in a Hat, on our face. Get your eyeliner and palette box ready. Hi everyone, this is Kain, and today we're going to be transforming into one of Picasso's many masterpieces, Head of a Woman in a Hat. Let's get started. I started out by blocking the brows down with glue sticks so that they'd be flat on the face and I'd be able to paint over them since I want to be able to do some funky asymmetrical brows later. And while that was drawing, I took a black eyeliner and I started etching out the shapes that I'd be making out of different colors later on. And I just referred to a reference picture for this the entire time. Next, before adding paint, I powdered down the brows to absorb any excess glue, and then I went straight into my face paints. Again, I'm referring to the painting to see which colors go where. A lot of Picasso's portraits had really twisted facial proportions, but this one that I'm referring to is actually pretty plain looking compared to his other work. But what really stands out is all the contrasting colors that kind of split the face in two. After painting all of the broad strokes, I then go in and add detail. One feature of a head of a woman in a hat is the subtle asymmetry of the eyes. I made this eye a little bit more dramatic and extended it outwards with a flick of the eyeliner, as well as adding some blue in the bottom to contrast the red, while the other eye I made more round by placing some white eyeliner underneath to exaggerate the height of the whites of the eye and I didn't wing out that eyeliner. I also use my black face paint to add some more contrast and detail to the paint, adding some asymmetrical bushy brows and borders where some of the colors meet so that it looks more detailed, like along the nose, the lips, and the neck. I added some false lashes here, which Picasso probably didn't have, but I had to add my own personal touch to the look. And I also put in some circle lenses off camera, which they're just colored contacts that make the eyes look a little bigger and more innocent, like the woman in the painting who kind of just stares blankly off into space with no expression. I didn't have green hair or a pom-pom straw hat like the girl in the painting, so I chose to opt for this big, teased out avant-garde mess to really keep the main focus on the colors of the face. And there you have it, this is how to transform into Picasso's head of a woman in a hat. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Awesome. Okay, up next we have a cool opera thing with a mystery and Sarah Gaddon from Alias so Grace. Bad, so like good. Duran, how can you improve on perfection? Don't... Just joking. Okay. okay, let's go. Okay, three, two. Claude Vivier grew up in Montreal with plans to become a priest, but at the age of 18, he left his religious order and decided instead to study music. He was an openly gay man in the 60s, traveling the world, composing music, and steadily building a name for himself. But because he was murdered at the age of 34, Claude Vivier's name and his work are not widely known today. This opera company believes that Claude and his opera Copernicus deserve to take their place in the Canadian canon. So here we are at Banff Centre where we're mounting Claude Vivier's only opera, a chamber opera called Copernicus, and we're presenting it right here in the Margaret Greenham Theatre. Copernicus is, I'm tempted to say, the greatest Canadian opera that has ever been written. And a lot of Canadians don't even know about it. And so it's simply, the story is a young woman or an older woman, it's not really specified, but she's, she's died. And she's going from that place of when you die to where you go after you die. And whether you believe there is that place or not, this opera is about that. So you have people who are making music with their voice, you have people making music with their instruments, and you have people making music with their bodies, all about rallying around this sort of, kind of like the one and only person who exists, and just saying, 
you're being welcomed now into where we go afterwards. What I love about it is it offers hope and it offers, you know, that there is something more than just this whole life, this whole earth. And that's what's kind of ultimately so incredibly beautiful about this piece that was written by a Canadian composer who kind of died way too early. Claude Vivier is one of, I believe, Canada's greatest composers. His body of work is limited because of his unfortunate death. And um, he's someone who I hope gets way more notice and credit that he deserves. We're taking this theater and we're kind of inverting it and kind of looking at it inside out. With that way, we're kind of setting it up where the audience is on stage and the set and the singers and the performers and the orchestra and the dancers, they're all performing in the seating that is normally for the audience. And by that, we're just kind of showing that this is already something different. I hope that the audience will just have a lot of questions, that they'll be doing a lot of thinking. I think his music in this piece stirs something in you that, that you're left kind of trying to figure it out for yourself. I think the more that we talk about him and the more that we play his music, the more we'll find his place in the Canadian canon of great Canadian composers. It's the year of Margaret Atwood on TV. First came The Handmaid's Tale, and now Alias Grace is what everyone's obsessing over. The star of the series is actress Sarah Gadden. You'll remember her from A Dangerous Method, Belle, and Letterkenny. She's here to tell us about the director that changed her life. Kind of feels like all the things you're trained not to do. Don't look into the lens. <laughs> now you're doing it. Ah! <laughs> The filmmaker that changed my life is David Cronenberg. I want to go with you wherever you go. Do you? The first Cronenberg film I ever saw was The Fly. Something happened when you went through, Seth. You've got to get some help. I think you must be sick. I was both terrified and completely engrossed in the film. Joined together in one body? More human than I am alone. I think what I loved so much about The Fly was that it's this whole complete world that he draws you into. And being such a huge fan of Gina Davis, watching her work in that film, she's so beautiful and complicated and, and completely compelling. Be afraid. Be very free. I remember being at the Toronto International Film Festival with a short film, and I was at the Canadian press conference, and David and Viggo Mortensen were there um, promoting, I think, a history of violence. And they were addressing the, the crowd, and all the press was kind of watching them and firing off questions. And I remember thinking, wow, I hope. I wonder if I'll ever be able to work with somebody like that one day. Surely you didn't think I'd let you go without putting up a fight. A few years later, I auditioned for A Dangerous Method on tape and was cast in the role, flew to Germany, was in my full hair and makeup as Emma Young, and I met David Cronenberg for the first time. Because he's such a dark filmmaker that I think people hope that he is a little more tyrannical, but he's not. He's really a total sweetheart. I won't go back there to the asylum. 
Flesh and blood cannot stand it. Playing Grace Marks in Alias Grace was definitely the most challenging role I've ever had. Um, but w what was so kind of interesting and great about it was that David Cronenberg is actually in Alias Grace, and he plays Reverend Verringer, who's kind of Grace Marks's protector and advocate and champion, and David has really been that for me in my life and in my career. We are hoping you will write a report favorable to Grace Marks. That is why we have brought you here. So to have him be a part of a project that is so important um, to me and my growth as an actor, and then to also be in it, it was pretty, it was pretty special. Okay, next up is a story where Facebook mm. facilitated the artistic oh, collaboration. Yeah. That was a good one. Facilitate yeah. book. Face, like. Let's just keep going with the show. Yeah. Okay. Roll camera. Facebook is a great place to keep up with family, share good news, and to check in on old lovers. Don't act like you've never tried. For this writer, Facebook also became the place where she found a long distance, artistic inspiration. I'll let her tell you more. I was on Facebook of all things, and an image caught my eye. It was a beautiful picture of a mother holding a baby and a father behind her carrying a load of stuff and problems. And the whole picture was made of rocks. It was an artist who lived in Syria. And I thought, my God, he's telling the story of refugees. There were 2,000 pictures. And I thought, if I took 30 and I put them in an order, I could write the words and we could make a book for kids. My book is called Stepping Stones. A Refugee Family's Journey. It's one of the very few books that explain war to children and empathy. But I also wanted to explain what happens in certain countries and how other countries need to be there to help. Hello? Hello. Are you... I hope you are okay. I am fine. How are you? Ah, uh, fine too. Thank you very much, Margaret. Nizar is the illustrator. He was delighted to have me use his photos, his art. I was really amazed how Nizar made his art. And what I found out once I was in touch with him is that he walks the beach where he lives in Syria and he collects rocks, large and small, and he brings them to the roof of his house. And he has one large board that he lays the rocks on to make an image. And then he simply used the cell phone to take a photo. I put them in an order where I felt they told a story, starting with the rooster at daybreak, showing the normal life in a village and what people did. And then war breaks out and how life changes and how people were fleeing. And he had all the images, you know, so this whole book was done backwards. Usually I write a story and I don't know what it will look like and how, how an artist will interpret it. This was totally different because the story was already there, the art was there, and I wrote the words to go with the images that he already had. War is unfortunately not isolated, but I hope that children and adults get out of the story is that we need to support refugees, no matter what, no matter where they come from. If this happens to you, you will want to know that you can go somewhere. Isn't that amazing how you can put so much feeling into pictures made with rocks? Since the book came out, I think it grew lakes of its own. It's been shortlisted for a lot of awards. It's been at least 22 weeks on the Canadian bestsellers list. I'm donating my royalties to refugee causes. It's really satisfying for me to know that I can donate to so many different causes and help. I love it when my 
books are socially conscious and create awareness in children. And I still have lots and lots of ideas, so I hope to keep producing a lot of books in the future. The lucky ones, they call us. New memories, new hopes, new dream. No more war, but peace. Thank you for joining me on another whirlwind adventure of art and creativity. Let me know what you thought of the show. Send me a message on Twitter or Facebook. Our handle is at CBC Arts. I'll be back again next week with even more incredible artists from Val Como to Nanaimo. Until then, keep creating and innovating. Peace. Awesome show. Thanks. I really like this episode, you know, artists inspiring artists. Mm, yeah, I like this theme a lot too. So now that your play is done, other side of the game, which enjoyed like sold out houses, standing O's, critical acclaim, is there any other artists that you'd want to like write about? Mm, good question. You? you know what? The writer Octavia Butler, love her life story, her oh. work. That would be, or even like a musical about Kanye, inspired by Kanye. That would be. Or really even cool. if you can't get those rights, you could write about me, like and my heroic deeds, and and the people I helped, and the cat that I saved from the so tree. So like a fantasy comedy, you're thinking. No, not a fan, like, just like a drama, <laughs> biopic. Are you mad? Oh, Romeo.